A dad was a great man. Not in a participation trophy kind of great way, like y'all are great, well, most of you, but he was truly great. Isn't that what we've heard today? And who of us doesn't want to live a great life and to accomplish great things? Let me ask you, how great would you say your life is this afternoon? On a scale of one to 10. Uh, If you would say a 10, God bless you. We are grateful for your great life. That's wonderful. But for most of us, myself included, it's a little bit lower than that. Life is hard. Life is complex, convoluted, complicated, and confusing. But what if I told you this afternoon that I could guarantee you a great life, that that dad had found the secret of a great life and he had given it to me and and this is a 100% money back guarantee that if you apply this you will live a great life, no cost, absolutely free. Would you be interested in that? How can we live a great life? That's the question I'd like for us to consider for just a few more moments as we reflect on dad's life. But first, allow me just to reminisce briefly uh, about my dad as a great family man, a great architect, and a great servant of God. Uh, Dad was a great family man. When we were growing up, dad was always kissing mom. I mean, come on, gross. We have so many pictures of them kissing. Well, at least four pictures. Well, exactly four pictures of them kissing. But we never doubted, as Kelvin said before, that dad loved mom and mom loved dad. Uh, And I found the other day among dad's stuff a little book that Kelvin gave to him as a Father's Day present in 1979. The book is titled, My Father Is. And and both Carla and I uh, would agree with all the things that Kelvin wrote. Kelvin wrote, our dad is a good mower. (laughs) Now, I don't think that's been spoken about enough this this afternoon. Uh, He was a really good mower. And and Melissa, those lines were straight. He, he, He was excellent at that. Um, Dad is a good eater, for sure. Yes and amen. (laughs) He is a good sleeper. Astute observation by Kelvin that our dad could sleep anywhere at any time. Uh, Dad is a good driver. That's our green station wagon. And on the top is a CB antenna. That is a cell phone of the 1970s. He was a great driver. Dad is a good joker. He had that contagious laugh that we will all remember. You might even call it a cackle at times. We'll remember and miss his great laugh. Uh, My dad is a nice person. I love that. And Kelvin ended with the only negative. My dad is a person who doesn't like the phone. (laughs) That is one of his greatest unspoken legacies that has been passed to all the shill men, uh, all his male descendants. Let's text more. (laughs) Dad was a great family man. And he was also a great architect. And I had the privilege of experiencing that firsthand back in 2014 when I became a client of Bob Schill. What a blessing that was. Our church was going through a remodeling project. uh, And my dad and tech team uh, came in to do the remodel of our church. His design started uh, characteristically on the cover of a Sunday morning bulletin. Uh, This was the back corner of our church. No, really, that was the back corner of our church. Pretty ugly. And this was it afterwards. Here was the front of our church building. And this is what it looked like when dad transformed it with the skills that God had given to him. He was a great family man. He was a great architect. And as we've heard this afternoon, he was a great minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's my very favorite picture of dad doing ministry. When he was swarmed by the kids that lived in the Mercy House, the orphanage on the seminary campus at Mission India Theological Seminary. I went with dad twice to India, and he would always make a point of visiting the kids, singing songs with them, spending time with them. They loved him, and every time he went there, they would swarm him. They called him Father Bob. And I thought, the first time I saw this, I thought, my dad's a rock star. (laughs) And in terms of greatness, ministry to the least of these is the greatest thing that any of us could do for Christ in this life. A dad was like the man from Matthew chapter 25 who was given the five talents, invested them and earned five more, Matthew 25, 21. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. 
you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Today has been a celebration of the many things that God gave to dad over, the, over his years. Well, what was his secret? What's the secret to a great life? Well, I'm going to tell you, and I want you to listen closely. If you need to, take notes. Uh, if you've been sleeping, it's time to wake up. Uh, this is not copyrighted. You're welcome to pass it along. You can write a book about it if you like or a blog about it. This secret will work for any person, young or old, educated or uneducated, rich or poor, healthy or sick, single or married, children or no children. This will work with both Republicans and Democrats, actually, <laughs> and even independents. This secret is effective in any country, any culture, at any time. It's a pretty important secret that really shouldn't be a secret at all. I call it a secret because I don't think most people know about it. Okay, you ready? Here it is. The secret of dad's great life was that he knew he wasn't great. The secret to his greatness was his conviction of his non-greatness. Bob Schill knew that he wasn't great, but that he served a great God. You see, the secret to a great life begins when we realize where true greatness comes from, not from us. Who was dad? He was a garden variety sinner, just like you and just like me. He struggled with temptations. He was prone to pride and anger. What we've celebrated today is actually not Bob Schill per se, but God working through Bob Schill, who learned how to die to his sinful self, to step aside in order to let the love and power of God be expressed through him. Galatians 2.20 puts it this way, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for us so that we would give ourselves to him. There's a picture that's been hanging in our home ever since I can remember. I think dad, it's a prayer, a framed prayer that I believe dad prayed probably back in college. Is that right, mom? And uh, here's a picture of it, uh, but let me read it for you. This was dad praying. He says, I pray God that you will give me the strength to make a success of my education, not for my own achievement, but for you and your kingdom. In my own strength, I cannot do it. But with Christ, all things are possible. I pray with the forgiveness of my sins. Amen. That's it. Confessing, in my own strength, I cannot do it. But with Christ, all things are possible. As a young man, Robert Schill came to the realization that it was not in him to do life well. And so he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and depended on God to work through him. And God's love and kindness expressed through dad, through his family, through his occupation, through his ministry, is what we've seen today, the beauty of Christ. In the last two weeks of his life, as his body was ravaged by cancer, that was about all we could see at the end. Uh, when he first went into hospice, he could still move his arms somewhat, and he would always be like the peace and the thumbs up. He just loved those for some reason. And he'd shake people's hands. He would hug people. He'd talk with people on the phone, always encouraging, praying for people, um, making a special point to encourage the nurses and the doctors. When he lost his ability to move uh, his hands anymore, but he could still speak, his words would encourage those around him. His words would assure us that he wasn't afraid to die. His words told us that, that, that we were going to be okay. He was still more concerned about the other people in the room than he was himself. And when he couldn't speak anymore, I tell you, the last thing he could do was smile. Right up to the very end. He, maybe not the big smile, but he could smile. And that smile was God in him. That was Christ's power and love in him. What he prayed we must pray. 
dear God, give me your strength to make a success of my life. In his strength, not ours, that's the secret. He knew that he wasn't great, but he served a great God. At this church, the first reformed church of Roseland, uh, Kelvin had mentioned earlier there on the south side of Chicago, a tired pastor makes a plea to the busy congregation for someone, anyone, to volunteer to teach a rowdy group of young boys. They were meeting in the kitchen, but they were so obnoxious that they were relegated to the church dungeon to the basement. At this exact house, 510 West 104th Street, a man named Joe Verbeek lives with his wife Mary and his son Henry and his two girls, Joan and Judith. These are Dutch immigrants. Joe attends the church. He hears the pastor's plea on Sunday morning, but he's busy with work. He's busy with his kids. He doesn't really have time, but he feels God telling him to teach this Sunday school class of boys. So he dies to his own desires. He musters up his courage. He's a painter, not a pastor, but he starts teaching this group of boys. He lives just 1.2 miles from the church, and I imagine that he would walk to the church every day with his family. And less than a mile away from Joe in this house, 10905 South Eggleston was another immigrant family from Lithuania, Ed and Mabel Schill, and their two boys, Bobby and Eddie, Uh, Every Sunday, the parents kick the boys out of the house, telling them to go to church. Little Bob Schill walks the .9 miles to the nearest church in the neighborhood, that same Dutch church, the first Reformed church of Roseland. And when he shows up, someone points him to the basement, and it was there in the basement that Joe Verbeek, the painter, taught Bobby Schill how to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. As Dad told the story to me later, he said Joe would say this phrase over and over again. Jesus loves you and you need to give your life to him. Boys, Jesus loves you and you need to give your life to him. Jesus loves you and you need to give your life to him. If dad were here today, he would say Jesus loves you and you need to give your life to to him. Give him your problems and your pain. Give him your fear and your failures. And then I think dad would say something like this, like that enthusiasm, he would say, God is good. He always liked to put his hands up. God is good. Give him your life. Jesus loves you. And you need to give your life to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for those of us who do know you, Thank you for this reminder for us to resist the temptation to think we are great in and of ourselves at all. And for any who do not know you, speak to them now. I pray, I urge them, Lord, to finally give their lives to you fully. The time is now. Life is so short. If you know that you don't know God like Bob Schill did, but you want that kind of a great life and legacy... I just invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just make these words your own words. Dear Jesus, I believe that you love me and I want to give my life to you right now. I believe you came and died on the cross for my many sins so that I can be forgiven and live the life you designed for me to live a great life. I surrender to you today. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus, amen.